The Three-Day Blow, a short story about marriage and relationships by Ernest Hemingway. They drank. Bill filled up the glasses. They sat down in the big chairs in front of the fire. You were very wise, Wemmage, Bill said. What do you mean? asked Nick. To bust off that Marge business, Bill said. I guess so, said Nick. It was the only thing to do. If you hadn't, by now you'd be back home working trying to get enough money to get married. Nick said nothing. Once a man's married, he's absolutely bitched, Bill went on. He hasn't got anything more. Nothing. Not a damn thing. He's done for. You've seen the guys that get married. Nick said nothing. You can tell them, Bill said. They get this sort of fat married look. They're done for. Sure, said Nick. It was probably bad busting it off, Bill said. But you always fall for somebody else and then it's all right. Fall for them, but don't let them ruin you. Yes, said Nick. If you'd have married her, you would have had to marry the whole family. Remember her mother and that guy she married. Nick nodded. Imagine having them around the house all the time and going to Sunday dinners at their house and having them over to dinner and her telling Marge all the time what to do and how to act. Nick sat quiet. You came out of it damned well, Bill said. Now she can marry somebody of her own sort and settle down and be happy. You can't mix oil and water, and you can't mix that sort of thing any more than if I'd marry Ida that works for Stratton's. She'd probably like it too. Nick said nothing. The liquor had all died out of him and left him alone. Bill wasn't there. He wasn't sitting in front of the fire or going fishing tomorrow with Bill and his dad or anything. He wasn't drunk. It was all gone. All he knew was that he had once had Marjorie and that he had lost her. She was gone and he had sent her away. That was all that mattered. He might never see her again. Probably he never would. It was all gone. Finished. Let's have another drink, Nick said. Bill poured it out. Nick splashed in a little water. If you'd gone on that way, we wouldn't be here now, Bill said. That was true. His original plan had been to go down home and get a job. Then he had planned to stay in Charlevoix all winter so he could be near Marge. Now he did not know what he was going to do. Probably we wouldn't even be going fishing tomorrow, Bill said. You had the right dope, all right. I couldn't help it, Nick said. I know, that's the way it works out, Bill said. All of a sudden... Everything was over, Nick said. I don't know why it was. I couldn't help it. Just like when the three-day blows come now and rip all the leaves off the trees. Well, it's over. That's the point, Bill said. It was my fault, Nick said. It doesn't make any difference whose fault it was, Bill said. No, I suppose not, Nick said. The big thing was that Marjorie was gone and that probably he would never see her again. He had talked to her about how they would go to Italy together and the fun they would have. Places they would be together. It was all gone now. So long as it's over, that's all that matters, Bill said. I tell you, Wemmage, I was worried while it was going on. You played it right. I understand her mother is sore as hell. She told a lot of people you were engaged. We weren't engaged, Nick said. It was all around that you were. I can't help it, Nick said. We weren't. Weren't you going to get married? Bill asked. Yes, but we weren't engaged, Nick said. What's the difference? Bill asked judicially. I don't know. There's a difference. I don't see it, said Bill. All right, said Nick. Let's get drunk. All right, Bill said. Let's get really drunk. Let's get drunk and then go swimming, Nick said. He drank off his glass. I'm sorry as hell about her, but what could I do? He said. You know what her mother was like. She was terrible, Bill said. All of a sudden it was over, Nick said. I oughtn't to talk about it. You aren't, Bill said. I talked about it, and now I'm through. We won't ever speak about it again. You don't want to think about it. You might get back into it again. Nick had not thought about that. It had seemed so absolute. That was a thought. That made him feel better. Sure, he said. There's always that danger. He felt happy now. There was not anything that was irrevocable. He might go into town Saturday night. Today was Thursday.
There's always a chance, he said. You'll have to watch yourself, Bill said. I'll watch myself, he said. He felt happy. Nothing was finished. Nothing was ever lost. He would go into town on Saturday. He felt lighter, as he had felt before Bill started to talk about it. There was always a way out. Let's take the guns and go down to the point and look for your dad, Nick said. All right. Bill took down the two shotguns from the rack on the wall. He opened a box of shells. Nick put on his Mackinaw coat and his shoes. His shoes were stiff from the drying. He was still quite drunk, but his head was clear. How do you feel? Nick asked. Swell. I've just got a good edge on. Bill was buttoning up his sweater. There's no use getting drunk. No, we ought to get outdoors. They stepped out the door. The wind was blowing a gale. The birds will lie right down in the grass with this, Nick said. They struck down toward the orchard. I saw a woodcock this morning, Bill said. Maybe we'll jump him, Nick said. You can't shoot in this wind, Bill said. Outside now, the Marge business was no longer so tragic. It was not even very important. The wind blew everything like that away. It's coming right off the big lake, Nick said. Against the wind, they heard the thud of a shotgun. That's Dad, Bill said. He's down in the swamp. Let's cut down that way, Nick said. Let's cut across the lower meadow and see if we jump anything, Bill said. All right, Nick said. None of it was important now. The wind blew it out of his head. Still, he could always go into town Saturday night. It was a good thing to have in reserve. The Doctor and the Doctor's Wife A short story by Ernest Hemingway Dick Bolton came from the Indian camp to cut up logs for Nick's father. He brought his son, Eddie, and another Indian named Billy Tabashaw with him. They came in through the back gate out of the woods, Eddie carrying the long cross-cut saw. It flopped over his shoulder and made a musical sound as he walked. Billy Tabashaw carried two big cant hooks. Dick had three axes under his arm. He turned and shut the gate. The others went on ahead of him down to the lake shore where the logs were buried in the sand. The logs had been lost from the big log booms that were towed down the lake to the mill by the steamer magic. They had drifted up onto the beach, and if nothing were done about them, sooner or later, the crew of the magic would come along the shore in a rowboat, spot the logs, drive an iron spike with a ring on it into the end of each one, and then tow them out into the lake to make a new boom. But the lumbermen might never come for them, because a few logs were not worth the price of a crew to gather them. If no one came for them, they would be left to waterlog and rot on the beach. Nick's father always assumed that this was what would happen and hired the Indians to come down from the camp and cut the logs up with the cross-cut saw and split them with a wedge to make cordwood and chunks for the open fireplace. Dick Bolton walked around past the cottage down to the lake. There were four big beech logs lying almost buried in the sand. Eddie hung the saw up by one of its handles in the crotch of a tree. Dick put the three axes down on the little dock. Dick was a half-breed, and many of the farmers around the lake believed he was really a white man. He was very lazy, but a great worker once he was started. He took a plug of tobacco out of his pocket, bit off a chew, and spoke in Ojibwe to Eddie and Billy Tabashaw. They sunk the ends of their cant hooks into one of the logs and swung against it to loosen it in the sand. They swung their weight against the shafts of the cant hooks. The log moved in the sand. Dick Bolton turned to Nick's father. Well, Doc, he said, that's a nice lot of timber you've stolen. Don't talk that way, Dick, the doctor said. It's driftwood. Eddie and Billy Tabashaw had rocked the log out of the wet sand and rolled it toward the water. Put it right in, Dick Bolton shouted. What are you doing that for? asked the doctor. Wash it off. Clean off the sand on account of the saw. I want to see who it belongs to, Dick said. The log was just a wash in the lake. Eddie and Billy Tabashaw leaned on their cant hooks, sweating in the sun. Dick kneeled down in the sand and looked at the mark of the scaler's hammer in the wood at the end of the log. It belongs to White and McNally, he said, standing up and brushing off his trousers' knees. The doctor was very uncomfortable. You'd better not saw it up then, Dick, he said shortly. Don't get huffy, Doc, said Dick. 
Don't get huffy. I don't care who you steal from. It's none of my business. If you think the logs are stolen, leave them alone and take your tools back to the camp, the doctor said. His face was red. Don't go off at half cock, Doc, Dick said. He spat tobacco juice on the log. It slid off, thinning in the water. You know they're stolen as well as I do. It don't make any difference to me. All right. If you think the logs are stolen, take your stuff and get out. Now, Doc. Take your stuff and get out. Listen, Doc. If you call me Doc once again, I'll knock your eye teeth down your throat. Oh, no, you won't, Doc. Dick Bolton looked at the doctor. Dick was a big man. He knew how big a man he was. He liked to get into fights. He was happy. Eddie and Billy Tabashaw leaned on their cant hooks and looked at the doctor. The doctor chewed the beard on his lower lip and looked at Dick Bolton. Then he turned at the way and walked up the hill to the cottage. They could see from his back how angry he was. They all watched him walk up the hill and go inside the cottage. Dick said something in Ojibwe. Eddie laughed, but Billy Tabashaw looked very serious. He did not understand English, but he had sweat all the time the row was going on. He was fat, with only a few hairs of moustache like a Chinaman. He picked up the two cant hooks. Dick picked up the axes, and Eddie took the saw down from the tree. They started off and walked up past the cottage and out the back gate into the woods. Dick left the gate open. Billy Tabashaw went back and fastened it. They were gone through the woods. In the cottage, the doctor, sitting on the bed in his room, saw a pile of medical journals on the floor by the bureau. They were still in their wrappers unopened. It irritated him. Aren't you going back to work, dear? asked the doctor's wife from the room where she was lying with the blinds drawn. No. Was anything the matter? I had a row with Dick Bolton. Oh, said his wife. I hope you didn't lose your temper, Henry. No, said the doctor. Remember that he who ruleth his spirit is greater than he that taketh a city, said his wife. She was a Christian scientist. Her Bible, her copy of Science and Health and her quarterly were on a table beside her bed in the darkened room. Her husband did not answer. He was sitting on his bed now, cleaning a shotgun. He pushed the magazine full of the heavy yellow shells and pumped them out again. They were scattered on the bed. Henry, his wife called, then paused a moment. Henry! Yes, the doctor said. You didn't say anything to Bolton to anger him, did you? No, said the doctor. What was the trouble about, dear? Nothing much. Tell me, Henry. Please don't try and keep anything from me. What was the trouble about? Well, Dick owes me a lot of money for pulling his squaw through pneumonia, and I guess he wanted a row so he wouldn't have to take it out in work. His wife was silent. The doctor wiped his gun carefully with a rag. He pushed the shells back in against the spring of the magazine. He sat with the gun on his knees. He was very fond of it. Then he heard his wife's voice from the darkened room. Dear, I don't think, I really don't think that anyone would really do a thing like that. No, the doctor said. No, I can't really believe that anyone would do a thing of that sort intentionally. The doctor stood up and put the shotgun in the corner behind the dresser. Are you going out, dear, his wife said. I think I'll go for a walk, the doctor said. If you see Nick, dear, will you tell him his mother wants to see him, his wife said. The doctor went out on the porch. The screen door slammed behind him. He heard his wife catch her breath when the door slammed. Sorry, he said, outside her window with the blinds drawn. It's all right, dear, she said. He walked in the heat out the gate and along the path into the hemlock woods. It was cool in the woods even on such a hot day. He found Nick sitting with his back against a tree, reading. Your mother wants you to come and see her, the doctor said. I want to go with you, Nick said. His father looked down at him. All right, come on then, his father said. Give me the book. I'll put it in my pocket. I know where there's black squirrels, Daddy, Nick said. All right, said his father. Let's go there. <laughs>